Right, good afternoon everyone. Um, well done for finding us and thank you for being here at this Onward panel. Uh, today we're going to be talking about charities um, titled Civic Superpower. If you are here to talk about the NHS and primary care, um, that is next door, it's a little bit confusing, um, but hopefully you're here for this. Well, we can answer on that if you're bored. Yeah, you don't yeah, yeah, it's, it's all good. Um, and so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Francesca Fraser and I'm a senior researcher here at Onward. And if you don't know Onward, we're a think tank, we're about almost five years old now. Uh, and we were created to create bold and practical ideas uh, to boost economic opportunity and strengthen communities across the UK. Um, and I just wanted to thank everyone to, before we get started, our panellists being out the time and pro bono economics for supporting this panel. Um, and I would like to add, we've got Lynn Perry joining uh, in a couple of minutes as well. And so what we're here to discuss today is how charities and not-for-profits can drive levelling up and really respond to some of these barriers to opportunity that we have across the UK. We know that charities are vital for supporting public services like social care. They're vital for our, our public realm, our social fabric, to giving, allowing people to come together and meet. Um, and also often on the frontier of fighting poverty around the UK. Um, and they are a vital asset to our social fabric, which is what some of Onward research has found. But their, their jobs are getting a lot harder. We know that people are donating less to charity over time, and that's something Pro Bono Economics research has done, um, has looked at. Uh, they found that incomes of the most wealthiest have grown about 10% since 2011, but typical donations from the top earners have fallen back by, by about a fifth. Um, and some of Onward's research, a paper called The Good Life, has looked at this as well. Um, and they also suffer from sort of fragmented funding streams. People who have set up charities often end up spending more time sort of filling in forms, applying to grants, than actually doing what they really want to be doing. Um, and so this conversation comes at a really vital time. Uh, you will all know that many families and individuals are set about to face one of the toughest winters that we've had in a really long time. Uh, and this is after the pandemic where reserves have been diminished and the d demand has increased. Um, so it's a really vital conversation and I'm looking forward to it. Um, and we're going to be discussing how charities can innovate to deliver their services, help more people, uh, find new funding streams. Um, and what that could look like to support them, particularly in poorer parts of the country where there might be lower levels of donation as well. Um, and we have a really, really br brilliant panel. So first we're going to come to Jerome Mayhew MP. Jerome is the Member of Parliament for Broadland, um, and prior to that was the Managing Director of Go Ape, I believe. Um, and next we are going to come to Guy Upperman MP. Guy is the Minister of Parliament for Hexham, and until recently was the longest serving Pensions Minister, so we're delighted to have him. Uh, next we're going to come to Matt Whitaker. Matt is the CEO of Pro Bono Economics, and he joined Pro, Bo Pro Bono from the Resolution Foundation. Uh, and lastly, we are going to hopefully hear from Lynn Perry, the CEO of Bernardo's, who I'm sure you'll be very familiar with for their work they do with children. Um, so it's going to be a really brilliant discussion and really delighted that everyone can be here to join it. So um, over to you, Jerome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Francesca. Uh, I'm going to start uh, looking not at the, the detail of how charities and the voluntary sector funds itself, but looking at the, the sector as a whole and what role it has to play in levelling up. If we think of levelling up, um, certainly in terms of public policy, as being large infrastructure projects, so we're building things to increase productivity in uh, left behind areas. Um, so, and we've got uh, relocation of public spending uh, away from the London, the Greater London, the South East, uh, a branch of the Treasury being in D Darlington, I think, as well. Or is it uh, Wolverhampton? No, Wolverhampton. Darlington. Yeah, Darlington. Darlington. DCLGs yeah, yeah. in Wolverhampton. So, so yeah, another good example. Um, but actually, if we stop and think about it, one of the most important aspects of levelling up is the disparity of social capital in areas of wealth, areas where you have strong community, the network of interrelationships, the organisations that make a place where you live, the community where you live, your home. There is a huge disparity between the strength, the, the density of that network, that web of interconnection, uh, in well-off areas compared to areas of, of poverty and deprivation. And that, if we, can, if we can address that as a government, I think that's going to go every bit as far in assisting uh, with levelling up as large infrastructure pro projects which deal with productivity <coughs> increases over the long term. But why are we in that position? You know, we've, we've got, uh, in my view, there's a philosophical problem behind here. 
And I was, I was listening to Michael Gove, who talks a lot of sense on a lot of things, but he was at the Social Capital Foundation uh, 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 event last night. And he said there is a fundamental difference between socialism, liberalism, and conservatism. And he said, with socialism, you have uh, the focus of uh, activity is about the state. The state uh, being, you know, grabbing your society and uh, affecting change from above. With liberalism, the focus is on the individual. It's not about community. But with conservatism, the focus is on community. And we start with the family and then with your village or your, your neighbourhood and you work up to love of country and nation as well. And I think it is that analysis, that insight about conservatism that should inform our approach to social capital. That we, as a party, should be working to maximise the interconnectedness, the, the things that make you rich. If you look at, I, you know, all of our politics is based on our own personal experience, isn't it? And I grew up in a village. Uh, in that village, just from the top of my head, there was the church, the awful church choir, which I was forced to be a part of. Um, there was the small village shop. There was a tiny primary school. There was the horticultural <coughs> society. There was the village hall. There was the cricket club. There was the pub. Um, and this is a village of 250 souls, something like that. Um, and all of those are massive webs of interconnectedness. And I'm lucky enough to represent a similar kind of place in, in uh, rural Norfolk, where we have poverty, we have, we have rural poverty, but we have independence. We, we rely and benefit from the interconnectedness of our relationships. And I think it's that area that the voluntary sector and, and uh, charities can really build the wealth of our country, not the, not the financial wealth in the first instance, but the wealth that makes it the place that we want to live. But there is a risk as well, and this is my challenge to the charity sector, which may not be wholly popular, and that is this, that charities that have become big and have morphed into being an arm of the state, an, ex, uh, an expression of policy, run the risk of falling into the socialist analysis of community and I think that becomes part of the problem rather than the solution when it comes to developing social capital. And, uh, but there are brilliant exceptions. I'm just going to name check one in my constituency, the Salvation Army in Fakenham. That is a national charity, but is so local in its approach and it's, it's, it serves with love the most vulnerable in our society. And I, I'm a huge supporter and you know, admirer of that. So it's not necessarily the size of the charity, but it's the attitude and the approach. And then I was thinking, well, you know, what are the examples of all the ones that I'm, that I'm talking to you about? And the answer is you won't know the names of them because they come from the communities that they're trying to serve. And that is, that is the, the groundswell of those, that web of connectedness that I think as a, as a society we should be supporting, certainly with our conservative philosophical vision of what a rich society looks like, that's where we should be focusing. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much, John. <coughs> and it actually touched on a lot of onward work as well, that when we talk about economic productivity and levelling up, actually the sort of social fabric of that place is vital too for sort of allowing people to be healthy and happy and work and where they want to work as well. Um, over to you, Guy. So I I'm going to stand up because there's a few people at the back so that you can all see me and you can probably admire the massive vomit uh, that my <laughs> nine-week-old child who... Uh, I'm delighted I brought to conference. I decided to deposit on my leg uh, before I came out. So, uh, I'm Guy Hoffman. I'm the MP for Hexham. And uh, I, I looked at the title of this and I wanted to be here because for me, uh, it's deja vu all over again. Because in truth, what we're really doing is we are going back about 13 to 14 years at the time of the 2008 banking crash. And we're having a discussion about how we can make the big society work. That's the practical nature of this discussion. For those of you who are fresh out of uni, who don't know what the big society is or was, it obviously is a great movie, but it is more particularly, it was a great idea by David Cameron to harness the uh, power of the charitable sector and many other third sectors to work collaboratively in local communities to make a difference where the state necessarily either wasn't acting or was acting pretty badly. And lots of great stuff came out of that. And then, no disrespect to David Cameron, I mean, he's only our fourth most recent Prime Minister, um, he lost his nerve on that and didn't drive it forward as much as he could have done. Partly because 
he was trying to do it as as we were in a situation that we were facing a uh, significant financial uh, downturn and it got pilloried and, and and portrayed as something that was this was basically the uh, then coalition government seeking to get people to step in uh, where they just didn't have the money to do it and they weren't prepared to do it. Utterly untrue and actually a very sad situation and much to the detriment of those politicians who argued against it because what was an absolutely brilliant idea just wasn't allowed to flourish. Now our objective surely today is to try and take the similar situation, this country is in financial difficulties as is pretty much every country in the world and we are also in a situation where we still want to achieve levelling up but the state is simply not able to step in and either fund or act itself and frankly uh, having been a government minister for five years or well, seven years in total uh, before I was so cruelly dismissed by the present Prime Minister totally her right um, but having done that I can tell you this government doesn't do stuff very well in this space but it doesn't necessarily subcontract it to charities very well otherwise so the, the genuine comment I would make, and I ran five massive arm's length bodies with a budget of close to, a, well, my total budget was about 138 billion, and my, I regulated 1.7 trillion pounds. So uh, in that space, we had some arm's length bodies who were doing massive amounts of work. I was commissioning stuff with well over a billion pounds worth of commissioning. That's a lot of cash. A lot of it's on things like debt support. Uh, you know, I employed citizens advice up and down the country. We had money and pension service. These organisations are massive. Are they doing as well as they should? I'm not totally sure they are. So I'll give you two quick examples. And um, you'll see from my biog, which if like me, I never read the biogs because I won't actually listen to them. So I've got a uh, long history in the pro bono world. I've done about 500 cases for free, taken them all the way to the Supreme Court, done about 100 um, what's called death row cases uh, in the Caribbean of uh, helping people who didn't have representation and who were on death row and a variety of other hospital closure campaigns that I fought. And I, I got this job in 2010 and I decided to try and uh, step into the space where all our banks were closing. My football team was being sponsored by Wonga. Uh, they weren't a very good football team but Wonga were even worse. And I thought we could try and do something. So it took a while. I worked with Church of England, a few other people, Archbishop York in particular. And we set up the fastest growing bank in the north of England, uh, which is called the Northumberland Community Bank, which is a beefed up credit union and it provides savings and loans across now the northeast and is hoovering up all the competition, I'm pleased to say, in a very capitalist way, but is also providing real support for those who are struggling on an ongoing basis. An example, in my view, of the state failing, because the state can't help those people. Banks, private sector, failing. They're withdrawing from the high street. Banks not really that interested in customers worth under £500. State has failed them as well, because we made it really hard to set up a bank account if you are low income, or you've got bad credit history, or you, all manner of complications. We're trying to fix it with basic bank accounts, but by and large, not doing a great job. But a community bank really can do it. And talking about Jerome's analogy of what his village looked like, well, that sounds to me a bit like the Sparkassen. So the Sparkassen is a uh, community bank that exists in Germany. It's part of the Holy Trinity that they say every German village has, which is a church, a town hall, and a local community bank. And that is the Holy Trinity that drives forward the German uh, way of life. And they are the three things that hold it together. So I think this is an opportunity. I'm going to try and give those who have come here from charitable sector who are going, well, come on, fix my problems, which is a perfectly legitimate thing, um, is slightly, if you want to change the world, look in a mirror. And, and go to government and the private sector with solutions to their problems, rather than saying, come on, fund me to make this work. Because I, I can guarantee you, you'll get a much better audience. Secondly, you'll actually be better at it. And I, I would give you two uh, opportunities to address that. So quite clearly, the Prime Minister is taking this country down a path where growth is key and where you've got to satisfy the funder on an ongoing basis of the added value that you are giving. And that added value, will, if you're being commissioned by the state, has got to be something that is genuine added value. So I think you're going to need to look at that in a very different way. And I would uh, recommend the, uh, if you know what ESG is, the social and ESG it seems to me is going to be utterly vital. 
Uh, there's a call for evidence that I published about um, six months ago, which looks at how the third sector can step into this space and help hugely with organisations who are already there with very large capital and who are trying to seek to influence it in a good way. I, I'll, I'll pause there. I could go on in great more detail, but there is a... Uh, you can fix your own problems, but you can also present them with solutions that will both assist your organisations and also change the world for a better thing. And surely that is something worth striving for. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much, Guy. And a really hopeful challenge as well as to your question of what government's role is in this is, and I'd quite like to come back to that as well. Um, Matt, over to you. Thanks, Francesca. Francesca um, I won't stand up because it took me about three minutes to squeeze into this seat. <laughs> um, so I run Pro Bono Economics, and for the last two years we've been running a, a commission, the Law Family Commission on Civil Society, um, which is chaired by Lord Gus O'Donnell and brings together deliberately people from the social sector, but also from the public sector and from the private sector, to collectively explore the role of civil society and how civil society can contribute even more to um, to the nation's well-being. So very much as, as Guy and Jerome have been, have been speaking about, civil society already does a lot. Um, it is unique. It is plays a role that straddles and sits between um, the public and private sectors. But how can those three sectors pull together in a way that means that actually they're all firing them on all cylinders rather than just seeing them in isolation? Now, that is a big programme of work, two, two years, as I say. I've done lots of these commissions in my career, and I'd say this is the most policy-rich one ever. Um, by the time we publish at the end of this year, probably looking at north of 50 recommendations, which is uh, quite a lot. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all of them. Instead, just a couple of quick themes, um, and three things, really. So in terms of uh, what, what have we found out over the last two years, one is that people really value civil society. So you know, nine in 10 people have used a charity. Uh, and actually, the true figure is probably much higher than that, because many people don't realize that, that they're interacting with charities when they are. Um, four in five people say that they're an important part of society. Um, in good times and especially then in bad times so through Covid you see the same thing going on again and even when we speak to policy makers and we did, we did a big survey of, of MPs, of local councillors, of civil servants and say to them with a sort of very hard headed pragmatic uh, approach you know, are these guys actually adding value to you? Even there, four and five say no, these are really sort of um, vital contributions that they make and amongst MPs it was 90% it was said that so really valued by people is theme one but then theme two is undervalued by economics, by my profession, and therefore by association, by policy makers. Uh, and what do I mean by that? So in, in, in sort of formal terms, the charity sector is valued at about 1% of GDP. And that's because we've got no means of measuring its actual value, because there's no price mechanism. So instead, the, the sort of contorted way we do it is just to add up the inputs basically the salaries of people who work in the sector and a, and a little, little bit extra and that falls short for very many reasons one is actually we underpay people in the sector relative to their skills if they work in the private sector they earn more so, you know. uh, second is there's no um, account there of volunteers and volunteers are massive within this sector clearly mm. and then thirdly there is no actual account of the actual value that is added in economic terms and for pro bono economics that's our day job we work with charities up and down the country to help them understand their impact so i can't give you definitive figures for what the multiplier should be but to just give you a quick example we did a bit of work recently with place to be which is a charity which uh, supports children with mental health issues in schools and what we did with them is we looked at sort of before and after intervention for those children what happens to the mental health and the well-being of those children and you can see relative to a control group of, of kids that don't have that intervention a, a you know, marked and statistically significant improvement in their well-being and we know from other figures that if you have higher well-being higher mental health scores in your early years then you are less likely to smoke less likely to be truant from school less likely to end up in front of a judge uh, less likely to end up in prison more likely to get into work and more likely to earn more when you're in work so over the course of those children's life lifetimes you are saving the state in terms of uh, health, in terms of what's being spent on education uh, and in terms of crime, and you're also benefiting yourself in terms of higher income and therefore benefiting the, the, the exchequer as well through higher taxes and lower benefits. So we run all of that, we look at the numbers and in this particular instance we were finding that for each one pound that Place2Be was spending they were generating eight pounds worth of benefits over the lifetime of those children. 
Now, eight to one ratio, if you get a return like that on any other investment, it's pretty good, so you go for it. There's all sorts of reasons why you have to put caveats around these figures. You can never be definitive. We work with lots of charities. They're not all eight to one. Some are significantly more, some are, some are less. Um, it's hard to be definitive, but nevertheless, our best estimate of the value of the sector is not 1% of GDP, it's more like 10%. But because we undervalue it in economic terms, we then undervalue it and overlook it in policy terms. And you can see that when you look even something as simple as how many charity leaders go on question time, BBC question time, it's 1% of all panellists are charity leaders. 6% are comedians. So we value charity leaders less than comedians in terms of being able to tell us what we think about the future of Britain. No, that doesn't seem right to me. Sorry, that was long. Uh, third one is bringing those two things together in a way. Charities are obviously at their most uh, essential in, in times of crisis, and we've had a couple of those recently. Um, but they're also under the most pressure themselves at those times. And so that's a model that doesn't really work. You know, you want this to be the safety net. You want this to be something that we can all rely on. But charities themselves, because of the, the, the nature of the model, are, are under a great deal of pressure. So how do you fix all of that? Um, as I say, we've got lots of recommendations. The three I would, I would give you very quickly. One is to have a philanthropy commissioner at the heart of government, someone who sits across the different departments, to think about in any policy um, uh, plan approach that you're taking within government, what's the role of philanthropy here? How do we bring in investment from um, those high net worth individuals, those foundations, those big charitable uh, organisations in order to understand this problem better, in order to direct more resource at this thing? At the moment there's one third of one civil servant doing that job. Uh, we think that should be something which is elevated. Second is to support charities with effectiveness, so picking up on, on Guy's point in particular, and, and allowing them to innovate. So how do you build an infrastructure, an architecture, which means that it's okay to take some risks? It's okay to try something different rather than just doing the same old thing because that's what your funders expect. And how do you disseminate best practice across the sector? We do it really well in the in the private sector. There's actually certain government schemes which just aren't available to charities, which are available to businesses. So again, we just think that charities are not uh, innovative in the same way that um, businesses are, and therefore they're not. And then finally, how do you build a better connection to policymakers? How do we get more charity leaders, stakeholders, those in grassroots organisations who have the insight and should then be working with the state and with the market on the solutions? How do you bring them into the into the same discussions? And you know, in, in many ways, that's quite easy. You just you just build it, and it will happen. Um, I'll stop there. Um, just to say, on the commission that concludes the end of this year, we'll have lots more uh, recommendations and detail then. But um, uh, as I say, it's, it's it's a big one. Great. Thank you so much, Matt. And, and a brilliant advert for civic society if we even needed one. Um, Lynn, I'd love to come to you next and thank you for joining us. Um, to provide maybe a slightly different perspective from a sort of charity perspective, perspective uh, and how you approach these challenges and what we need to do about it. Yeah, thank you. Um, apologies. Um, I was running um, from another event, um, actually, where we were um, really seeking to influence um, policy and um, legislation. So um, I'm, I'm Lynn Perry. I'm Chief Executive um, at Bernardo's. Um, I have spent, I think, 22 years now um, working in the charity sector, um, very specifically with a focus on um, children, young people, families um, and communities. And um, I want to share some um, insights from um, that perspective um, today and also to give you um, a bit of an illustration um, of um, work that we did during the pandemic, which I think really illustrates um, the value that can be unlocked within um, civil society. Um, for those of you who don't um, know very much about Bernardo's, um, we are the largest um, of the children's charities. We've been around for 156 um, years now, so I haven't personally been um, around that long, but um, you know, I, I suppose one of the things that um, I would say about that is that we have demonstrated our ability to be relevant and responsive to the changing and emergent needs and vulnerabilities within local communities. And um, there's no doubt that um, you know, we wouldn't still be thriving um, had we not demonstrated um, the, the capacity to do that. 
our focus is very much on those who are most vulnerable um, or most disadvantaged um, within society and we're focused specifically on better outcomes for more children so um, we are um, we are we are specifically wanting to work in that space we do work around early intervention and prevention and we think that's really important work but we also do a lot of targeted um, work with children and young people and um, we've seen um, their needs change of course um, over the years so um, our work um, in turn has um, has changed with um, with their needs I suppose a couple of things to say just by way of um, that you know the difference I guess that um, the charity sector is able to make for lots of children um, and young people and parents and carers there's often a stigma that's still associated with access to statutory um, services and I think being able to come in um, across the threshold of um, community buildings where you know that you're going to be met with professionals in the charity sector is something that breaks down barriers for some people when they're looking for help and it's important that we've got those sort of complementary um, services within local communities but also um, we're able to help those families then to access those statutory services when they do need them um, and, to, and to do that in a supported way that achieves better engagement and often um, better outcomes so there's a there's a there's a localism you know we're a national children's charity we're a four nation charity across the UK so we think nationally but we act locally mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the things um, within the sector is that we you know we're rooted in local communities there's often a good understanding of what we do and why um, and people see our services as their services so that sort of community based um, asset um, perspective and we had a great example during um, COVID of how we can work in a very complementary way um, across the safeguarding system for children and young people. So if we cast our minds back, um, you know, time, time moves on quickly, doesn't it? But there was a period where schools were closed um, for significant periods of time and we had bubbles in and bubbles out um, of schools. And there was a, a cohort of children um, and young people who were absent from the protective um, systems that schools can provide and weren't able um, to get the support that they might ordinarily um, get from teachers who might identify for example quite early on because they're in relationship with those children um, changes in their um, mood presentation um, schoolwork etc and we didn't have that in place consistently through um, the covid pandemic and one one of the things that we recognised was that there was a group of children who weren't accessing any other statutory services because they didn't meet the threshold to, but were in increasing need of support, either because of um, their own mental health deteriorating, because of the pressures of COVID within the home, because of them being absent from school, because of an increase in some circumstances in their caring responsibilities as children for um, poorly parents, because of an increase in um, domestic abuse a whole range of issues but where children weren't necessarily meeting the threshold for support and alongside um, the Department for Education we developed a program that was called See, Hear, Respond and it was aimed at targeting um, those children um, not at risk of immediate harm but with emergent vulnerabilities and emergent needs that were going unmet and one of the things that I think um, was really important about this programme was that we recognise the importance of localism. We recognise the importance of those small, voluntary community sector organisations as well as the big national um, charities. And we created a partnership of 84 um, partners in that See, Hear, Respond programme who were able to reach children and young people in communities who were trusted um, locally 
and what that meant was that we were able to get swift and easy um, support into those communities for children, um, young people and families to access. And uh, over, the, over the period of that programme, we reached over 100,000 children and young people who otherwise um, would have gone without um, their needs being adequately supported. So I think from the perspective of prevention and early intervention um, and, and making sure that problems don't become entrenched and embedded um, in the longer term, that's the, that's the power really of, um, of the charitable sector. So the issues that um, we were working on during that period included mental health and wellbeing, school attendance when schools do reopen because for lots of children there was anxiety about returning um, to school, anxiety about what was happening um, at home and um, I've just come actually from um, another panel event where we were talking about online safety um, but criminal exploitation was one of the things that we started to see um, some very real risks um, presenting in during that period not just um, in communities but also online because of course lots and lots of children and people were spending more and more um, time online during that period so I, I share that really just by way um, of an illustrative um, an illustrative insight of course a lot of our work is funded um, so um, I think to the point about you know going to government with solutions to um, their problems, that's a lot of what we do as a charity. We take our practice-based evidence, we take evaluations of impact from the work that we do, and we do take those proposals so that we can think about scalability, replicability, new solutions to emergent um, problems. And we're also doing a lot of work at the moment, which I have got time to talk about here today but which is focused on systems change um, so I think the challenge actually um, about how do we change the system and how do we use the sort of insights the innovations the developments within um, the charitable sector to achieve greater change um, is a is, 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 is a challenge that we um, relish and we're certainly seeking every opportunity to do that brilliant um, thank you so much then uh, I might have a couple questions myself and then we'll go to the audience, so please do sort of start thinking of them. Um, and I wanted to come back on your point actually, Lynn, which is about the very local aspect of charities. Um, we see in our in our work we do it onward and that often these charities that are on the sort of most local level, embedded in communities, they mm. know they have their own relationship, they know people are the trusted sources of help mm. in those communities. Um, we saw it very recently when we were in Walsall for this work we're doing called Leveling Up in Practice, where um, there was a charity that actually mainly did sort of adult skills, but um, through COVID they ended up running the whole testing for the whole of the community, the whole of the local authorities, just around the corner, mm -hmm. um, because they had those local links. Mm. Um, but not everywhere has those sort of institutions and charities that are able to do it. And I, and I just wanted to hear from the panel about what, what the role of, of government is to to boost that kind of local provision um, it's naturally very sort of bottom up uh, and so if there's a role for sort of policy makers and ministers we've heard about sort of structural change at the centre of government and the community bank um, but if there's a role for government in that place and if so um, what might that look like um, Matt I'll come to you first I've got a half-baked analogy which um, no, no one's yet sort of told me is bonkers but probably is <laughs> which <laughs> is uh, um, sort of rail privatisation or any sort of utility network privatisation, whereby um, you know, the model we've settled on is is, is one primarily of um, centralising the pipe work and then allowing local providers to work with local markets because they've got the knowledge and, and, and all the rest of it. And I think there's something like that here, which is rather than ask every individual charity to have to think about um, innovation and um, find partners in the local area, go out and seek volunteers, find the philanthropic funding and other forms of funding. What about if state could play a role in providing that pipework? Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the sort of specific thing we've got in mind is a sort of at the national level you have a, a centre which is doing the research, understanding the insight, looking at what works in, in charitable models in different parts of the country and indeed different parts of the world 
but then a local network which helps to disseminate that but provides also a one-stop shop so if I'm and then um, Jerome touched on it before in terms of uh, the sort of distribution of, of good works and um, philanthropy and so on what's what's if, if every you know rich white guy in in England decided to put money into donkey sanctuaries in Grimsby we'd have a lot of donkey sanctuaries in Grimsby and we'd still have lots of very hungry kids uh, just down the road but none of those none of those philanthropists will know that their um, their friends and neighbours are also giving money to donkey sanctuaries because we don't have any means of coordinating any of this you know it's, it's, part, it's part of the nature of the model you know, in, in the private sector you use prices to match supply and demand in the public sector you have the controlling hand of the state we don't have that in this in the social sector and that's a good thing that's part of it's it's you know it's strength it's that organic nature but if you can coordinate and have that one-stop shop where if i'm a philanthropist and i'm thinking okay donkey sanctuaries grimsby yes please and i walk into my one-stop shop and actually it turns out it's that's already sorted well can i go elsewhere is there another part of the country where that needs donkey sanctuaries or is there something else in grimsby that i can do if i'm a volunteer and i walk in okay i want to give my time i want to help where do I go? How, how can I be used to the best? If I'm a charity, I can come in and I can say, okay, who else is working on the same thing as me? Can I collaborate with them? Can we share back office functions? Can we have a, a shared space where we run training events together and things like that? So I think if, if governments, and actually I, what I'd actually say is not just government, government and the private sector, and indeed the social sector as well, collectively fund that pipe work because it's in everybody's interest to have a strong... Uh, social sector and strong social capital, particularly in those areas of the country that need uh, most most help, then then I think that's a system that, that would benefit us more than just the sort of chaos that we have at the moment. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Jerome, can I come to you on this question? Yes, look, I, I recognise I, I see this differently. Okay. And um, I don't really apologise for that. Actually, I, yeah, we should have a multitude of uh, different approaches here. Because from my perspective, large charities doing the work of the state is part of the problem um, and it's a you're, you're not actually a charity you're contracted to provide a service um, which is an emanation of the state and it's the problem with that kind of top-down status dare I say it's socialist outlook is it lets us all off the hook all of us as members of society can say that's not my problem it's you know, the state uh, it's not my problem that there's you know, even this on the streets that's the council I think we need to reassess what it is our relationship one with each other and the community in which we, we live and the community that we want to support. I think there is such value, this is where we're coming on to the, the Treasury, there's such value in the, the interconnectedness of social responsibility, the, the, the networks that I was talking about in my, in my opening uh, comments, that at the moment is not measured by the Treasury at all. It has no economic value as to whether or not we have, let's say, a library or a, or the bowling club or the bring and buy, the, you know, even the whatever it is on the in in, in your uh, local community. And as a result, there is no support for it. And yet, we know all of us know how valuable it is. Uh, valuable it is. If you're trying to, if you want to buy a house and you're moving into a new area, what do you look for? You say, well, I want to have, you know, I want to have a, a villa. If I'm, you know, I always talk about rural communities because that's where I'm from. You know, is there a pub? No, is there is there anything going on in the village, or is it just a dormitory town for somewhere else? And we we vote with our wallets when we buy houses which are in socially connected areas. They cost more. They are literally more valuable to people who have an economic freedom of you know, decision making. And yet, as the treasury, when we're trying to, as a government, we're trying to build the quality of people's lives in all its forms. We have no value of that at all. And as a result, we don't take the necessary steps to facilitate and encourage and give those little economic indicators, you know, nudges, both carrot and stick, to encourage the development or support the retention of those areas. So that is an area I think we should collectively be focusing on, is how do we give an e a mechanism of economic valuation to the Treasury and then encourage them to give, to use the levers that they have at their disposal to encourage. But I come back to the first point, is I do not believe that large organisations telling people what to do is the solution. I want to have de devolution of power. I'm gonna, if I'm allowed to just for, for another 30 seconds, go back to go back to the worst point of COVID, when there were 80 year olds who couldn't go to the supermarket. Um, as a real problem, and we thought that people might actually have, be without food in their own homes. Do you remember that? It was a sort of Aprilish of 2020. 
what worked brilliantly is that the distribution of help came down and relied for the final mile on the volunteers in each community. This is what happened in Norfolk. The final mile relied on the usual suspects. The state did not say, we're the professionals, this is an emergency, we're going to do it. They relied, and it was different in every single parish. Some, it was the, it was the church, others it was the parish hall committee, uh, and the, the, we were sufficiently local in Norfolk to know who the, the, the usual suspects were in each community. And as a result, nobody got left behind because it was from the community supporting uh, the intervention. And it's that model that I would love to to sort of unlock the power of that in in wider society. Brilliant. Thank you, Jerome. And I'd like to add, Onward has done lots of work on parish councils in particular, so delighted to be talking about parish councils. Um, Guy, can I come to you on this? Um, and sure. And to come back on Jerome's points too. Um, so uh, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, we as a country have got to change. I think we are apathetic as to wealth. We are critical rather than celebratory. And uh, one of the reasons we don't have philanthropy is because we denigrate wealth. We don't celebrate people who have done really, really well. Because you go to America, wealth is something to be attained, something to be celebrated, but then their giving back to society is streets ahead of us. Because they don't feel pilloried. They don't feel that they are somebody who should be ostracized. So I think we have to change our approach. I think charities have got to really change their approach to that. I think the majority of the charity sector um, dabbles in politics way too much to the detriment of themselves and they, they don't get the engagement from successive governments because of that and focus on the core product focus on what you are actually doing is my strong advice the second is we have to change as a country and i'll give you the prisons example so i've written a book you probably won't have read it called doing time about prisons in in norway uh they have what's called a community prison why because the community takes responsibility for the people who have lapsed in their society we as a country, what do we do? If someone commits a crime, I want them behind a big wall, I don't want them to know anything about them, and I don't really care, and I certainly don't have a single newspaper that will ever write a story about the outcome of the people who are in prisons who are at least 50% uh, illiterate, uh, excluded from school, in care as children, etc., etc. My point being is that if we want to change this, we want to make sure that we actually solve problems in our community and we have to change our outlook. That is something we need to do. And, and my final, if I was going to be a legislator, which obviously I'm not going to be for the next 18 months, that's quite clear, um, but if I was a legislator, I would intervene in the medical world massively. And I would uh, effectively mandate that you can't have small charities. Because uh, it's very, very upsetting to everybody who set up a small charity, and apologies if you're here and you want to tell me about it later. But the blunt truth is you are really inefficient use of your resources, and you are replicating stuff that everybody is by and large already doing. The best example is Macmillan Cancer. That is an amalgamation of dozens of cancer charities. It is also probably the most effective cancer charity in the world as a result, because they have um, bulked up and they have the capacity of greater influence and capacity to provide a better service around uh, the country. I've had a brain tumour where a very nice surgeon took a small chainsaw to my head and cut a horseshoe-shaped uh, uh, scar there. In that process, I was uh, accessing about 30 to 40 different brain tumour charities. I would scrap the lot and amalgamate them all into one or two at most different charities so that we can actually drive forward real change there. They can have some localised input, but the truth is there is too much uh, amalgamation of pre-existing work and loss of the impact that you could have. But don't worry, there's no chance of me being the minister to do that. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Guy. Um, Len, can I come to you and maybe come back on some of these points and then we'll go to the audience. We've got about 15 minutes left. Yeah, certainly. So, I mean, not, not surprisingly, um, you know, I don't agree um, with some of what, um, of what has been said. And that's, you know, that's fine, isn't it? That's the beauty of these panels, that you get a diversity um, of, um, of insights. I think one of the things that, um, you know, we're really keen to do as a charity
charity. We worked with over 380,000 children and young people last year. And one of the things that I think is really important, and we, you know, we, we see this as a key responsibility, is making sure that the voices and the lived experiences of children and young people and families and communities are heard. Um, we don't necessarily see that as um, dabbling in, um, in politics, but we do see that as seeking to influence um, change for people in our communities who, you know, for whatever reason, are experiencing disadvantage or vulnerability and whose needs um, are unmet. And it, one of the things that we try to do, I think, is give voice to some of that in a way that offers um, insights into the dialogue diversity of experiences across um, the UK, whether that's in um, urban areas or rural areas, whether it's in mental health or whether it's in um, experiences of um, policing or education. Um, so I, I think it is, you know, I think it's really important actually to find ways for those voices to be um, heard and expressed and that's, you know, that's certainly um, what we seek to do. I, I, I do think that there is more um, to do in respect of coordination nation. Um, and certainly, um, you know, as a as a national charity, we do a lot of work in partnership with others, and we think very carefully about who's doing what, where, um, to what effect, and to what impact, and are there greater efficiencies that could be achieved by working um, together and collaborating on things through partnerships. Um, and of course, that's better in areas where there are good infrastructure arrangements for the voluntary um, community sector than it is in areas where there, you know, there's not investment um, in some of those infrastructure um, bodies. So there is, there is some variability. Um, I do think coordination um, is important. And I also think efficiency um, is important. So I think there are some principles um, that we um, are probably um, agreed on, but also um, I think there's a devaluing of some of what the sector um, can, can, can bring um, in some of the challenges. Thank you. So there's a bit of some, not so much disagreement, but healthy, healthy debate on sort of the ability of charities and scale and capacity to, to, to respond to some of these problems and also the need to have very individual solutions at a local level. Yeah. Uh, and there's, you know, there's, there's overlap there. Um, so I'd love to go to some questions. We've had a gentleman at the back who's been waiting very patiently, uh, and then I'll go to this gentleman here. Um, Bringing all those different perspectives together, how do you stop the likes of a big society agenda, which would be creating a civil service, civil sector infrastructure, from being politicised and polarised? So you just go back to step one again, and the charity is even more frustrated than politicised. Thank you. And you, sir? Hi, I'm Theo Clare, work for NBC. We're a think tank for the charity sector. Mm. I think we all agree that there's clearly a lot of charities, and particularly now at the continent of the crisis, uh, a lot of doing essential work to support people around the country. Um, I think one of the problems that we see is that not all charities are necessarily as effective as Bernardo's at measuring their impact or getting people through. And we've just uh, released a, a, a guide for MPs on how they can think about working with charities in the continent but obviously one of the issues they face is for, 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 for gentlemen like you, it's not always easy to tell who are the good ones and who aren't the good ones. And so I guess I'm interested to hear everyone's view about how we can kind of try and filter through and get people uh, reporting better on that. And maybe this comes to some of what you were saying, Matt, about that one-stop shop. Brilliant, thank you. So we've had two quite different questions there. The first one on uh, big society and civil society and how it can avoid getting sort of politicised at scale. Um, and the second one about valuing charities and, and understanding some are better than others and how we how we look at that. Um, Guy, if it's right, I'll come to you first on those. Sure. Um, it requires courage to answer your question on the part of politicians, in both in government and in opposition. The Conservative opposition between uh, 1997 and 2010 was car comparatively gutless because they exploited situations where charities either failed or individuals were uh, let down by the state and or the third sector. That is clearly going on. You can, I can give you dozens of examples between, since 2010. 
So it requires courage when you're in power not to uh, turn this into a political football. It requires courage of all of us uh, when we're in opposition. And that is something that will be very much upon Jerome and myself if we lose the next election, is that how are we going to judge the Labour government, but also not necessarily get uh, use this as a political football. That that And that also requires all of us. And it is, any time I read that X or Y has decided to speak to the Guardian, I know that the conversation is over, because you're into a political debate. It's so debate. frustrating yeah, that of course. interest is like... Um, it, it is. For, for I mean, I years. would personally, um, I will be nicely radical, because I'm no longer in government, and I would personally say, I always question um, charitable uh, leaders who decide to then get into the political space. Because it is, the moment you do that, you invalidate, in my humble opinion, uh, the nature of the amazing cause that you will be espousing. And, that, and you end up becoming part of the problem. Just to answer the gentleman's there is that I think that, that, you know, the fair point is made by Matt that sort of trying to get a, a value metric. Personally, I would do legal tables. So the, the greatest medical innovator in, on the planet in the last 20 years is Bill Gates. You know, um, if you want me to find out how it is that someone is having an impact, I can tell you that Bill Gates is single-handedly getting rid of polio. I can tell you all the stuff that he's doing. And I can actually measure, because he does it, uh, the actual bang for the buck, literally, that he gets for the work that he's doing. That would be something that and it's got to be done independently, I agree with you. Because normally, most organisations mark their own homework. Government does, charities do just as well as everybody else. Um, there is a charity commission as well, but... Frankly, uh, I'm a massive fan of league tables and driving it forward and making it much more easy to be a philanthropist, much more easy to get involved. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Matt, can I come to you on this question of sort of measuring value? You've spoken it a bit more, but maybe go into a bit more of this question. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, it's not, it's not easy. Um, not least because, well, for all, all the reasons guys already outlined in terms of marking your own homework, but also just resource, you know, if you're working mm. in a small charity in particular, you, you know, the mm. idea that you're going to be capturing data as you go and then reporting on it is, is for the birds. Uh, and particularly, you know, many will turn around and say, well, what I do, you can't capture in pounds and pence. It's it's about, you know, the, um, uh, how people respond and how you change their, their sort of, their, their turn their life around. And actually, you know, there are there's positive moves there because already in the in the treasury's own green book it's guidance to its officials on how you can compare and contrast different opportunities different policies and different investment opportunities there is now a means of putting a, a standard metric against well-being you know, the well-being measure um, but the key then becomes whether it's that whether it is the pounds and pence approach whatever it is is consistency so guy talked about ESG and you know again for those that know it, the E in ESG, the environment, is well advanced of the S, social. So businesses are very focused on net zero and climate change because those are two things you can measure your contribution towards in a relatively robust and scientific way. And there's just a consensus around those as being you know, important. There's actually much more within E that you could get into, but those are the two things that, that businesses have, have landed on. And we need something similar on the S. So you have a, a, a sort of consistent approach to what matters in terms of S and then how you go about measuring it and then we need whether, whether it is an independent organisation or indeed you know marking your own homework you know that's, that if you do it well then, then that's okay mm. but you must be doing it using the same measures rather than having the snake oil salesman sort of coming along and saying oh yeah you know what you're doing is brilliant and actually for every pound you put in you get 50 pounds here. But you can, mm. on ESG you can measure the environmental impact you're investing by reference to the Paris Climate Change Agreement which is what we're getting 1.5 trillion pounds worth of pension funds are doing. On social, we can also do that and are beginning to do that. Have a look at the call for evidence. There is a whole host of things, particularly on supply chains. Okay. Um, Len, you've been sort of nodding away. Do you want to add anything on this? Yeah, I mean, I think I think impact data um, is really important um, it, from an accountability and a responsibility um, perspective in terms of stewardship of the resources um, within the charity sector. Um, a, a lot of work that, uh, as you know, a lot of work that um, you know we deliver within Bernardo's. We do have independently um, evaluated. We have outcomes and impact frameworks um, in place to demonstrate um, the change and because of our size and scale we're often able to aggregate that and it's that sort of um, information um, and data both about what works but also about changes um, in vulnerabilities and emergent needs that we seek to share for the purposes of positive influence and um, change more widely but um, 
you know, it is variable, and some of that actually is down to resources. It's down to the size um, of some of those providers. It's down to the resources that they have to deliver um, the work that um, you know is 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 often quite operationally um, orientated, um, and it's about whether or not it affords the commissioning of some independent um, impact. Um, evaluation too, so it's not always it's, it's not always as easy for smaller organisations. Okay. Right, I'm not going to comment on that. It's not my area of expertise. You've had my experts give you a good answer on politicisation. I'm actually somewhere between the two of these uh, mm. uh, positions because a charity, part of its role properly, mm. is to draw attention to injustice uh, in its area, and I accept that. However. You need to think carefully the nature, how you go about doing that, because you run the risk of a alienating part of your own giving community, who may not share your views on that particular issue. But also, when you're when you're dealing with government, if you're being lectured the whole time in the politics of outrage, which is, I'm afraid, too often what it becomes, is you you end up getting a, a, a deafness from ministers. So it's it's ineffective. How you, you know, it's, there has the potential for it to be ineffective positively counterproductive because you get the, the bunker mentality from government and it runs the risk of alienating the silent majority if, you, if you're if um, you not very clever about it. So I, I recognise the, the right and often the need mm -hmm. but the, the manner in which it's done all too often has been counterproductive in my view. Right. Um, we might have time for sort of one or two more questions if they're very brief if possible. I'll go to you and then you. So, uh, my name's Will Grass, I'm from the We're Right Here campaign for community power. I just want to uh, really thank Jerome for talking about the de devolution of power, because I feel mm -hmm. like that might be key to the um, to showing trust in the community organisations, right. organisations, which they say they need and which they don't get from the local state, from the national state, or even from the large, larger charitable sector. Yeah. Um, I suppose the question is then, how do you do it? I mean, you know, we have a proposal, a Community Power Act, we're interested to hear the panel's views on how you get power down to the level where it needs to be at the level of Great, thank you. So one question, and then you know, very briefly, if possible. Thank you. Hi, uh, Mark Ori from Street Games. We're a national sports charity that work in the poorest areas around the UK. Um, I'm really interested in scalability and replicability. I, I think it's there's so much good happens in the sector that is funded for a short period of time, mm. and then there is no way of developing social replication in the way that a business would franchise against the market, because what we're dealing with most of the time is a non-market. There are people who cannot afford to pay for the services that we're offering. So I'd just be mm. interested in the panel's view. Great, thank you. Um, Jerome, I'm gonna to come to you on devolution yeah, power, and then, one. great. Okay, um, you're absolutely right, of course. We furiously agree with each other. Um, the the, the mechanism that I think is worth exploring, and I'm really looking forward to reading a bit more about your proposal, uh, is something was, uh, called double devolution, where my the starting point should always be that power is devolved as far as possible, consistent with the delivery of whatever that thing is. We, there sh that should be the default position. You should go as close to the people as possible. And my starting point is at the it's at parish council level. It's at that sort of level. But then the, the obvious riposte is, well, they're not set up to, you know, in some areas that's fine, be, you've got really great people. Other places it's hard to co-opt people onto a parish council or, or the equivalent. Um, and so it does need to be support, otherwise we're devolving down to fail. And there, I think there is a role for district council, if you've got um, that level of local government, uh, to provide the back office support, training and encouragement, frankly, but that the decision making is devolved down so the power over the money is taken at the very micro local level. And you think, well, that's, that's risky. Yes, it is. And in, let's say 10% of those experiments, it's gonna go wrong. But the, the benefit, the net benefit of it working in 90% of communities will be so empowering. Just imagine that. If, you're, if you knew that your parish council or, or whatever, the, your, your urban equivalent of the parish council genuinely had the power to, 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 to spend the money that affects the, the services in your area, how brilliant would that be? And, and then you think, well, actually, it's really worth being on the parish council because it makes a difference and you have ownership of public services. We get rid of this state telling us what to do. And we start saying, yeah, OK, the money's gone up there, but it's come back down here and we decide. This is a hugely empowering conservatism where we, fo we focus on community and we support it.
Great, thank you. Um, Guy, I'm going to come to you on scale and I'm going to give the last word to Matt um, and then we're going to have to wrap up, I'm afraid. So scale, um, I, I wouldn't bother with this date. I would totally ignore ministers. Uh, I don't think you'll get anywhere with it. Um, and I would uh, go and sell your project, of which I know it, uh, to a philanthropist. And I would say, just as Sir Peter Vardy has done in respect of uh, troubled families and things like that uh, with the battle project throughout the country, just as Paris has done with academies, yeah, I could give you half a dozen uh, very wealthy individuals who will fund the whole thing. And that's what you should go and do. Identify the problem, ignore the state entirely, they will get in your way. Brilliant. Um, Matt, final word to you, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, thank you. And um, how do you how do you sort of bring all that together? But I think one of, one of the key things that I hope comes out of this is this sector is in very direct terms in terms of employment about the size of the construction se sector. Mm. In <clears throat> more indirect terms, it is significantly larger than that. You know, you sort of think about the finance sector, and I think like any sector that is important for growth. Uh, and for social um, well-being, you need to nurture it. And so, I don't think the role of the state is to be handing out money or to be, you know, sort of, yeah, sort of trying to take over what charities do in any way. But I do think investing in the same way you would invest in any other sector, uh, in the architecture, in the infrastructure, in the pipe work, and working with the sector as partners and building on the insights that that those who are on the front line can bring in the same way that they do with business in the same way that you, know, you do not go into any conversation as a as a sort of leading politician in Britain about the future of Britain without thinking about what's the role of the market what's the role of the state together well why don't we include the social sector in that as well Brilliant. Um, I think that's a great note to end on. Um, it feels like we could have gone on for a lot longer and there's been some sort of healthy discussions, some agreements a little bit less so in other places. Um, but I'd just like to end and say thank you so much to our panel, Len, Jerome, Guy and Matt. Um, and Onward is doing a lot of work in this space. We have spoken about sort of double devo, something we've done a lot of, and sort of more charitable and the role of civic society. Um, so I really appreciate you giving up your time and thank you everyone for coming as well.